Welcome everyone. My name is Katrin Radke. I'm working at the Ruhr University Bochum's Institute for Law of Peace and Armed Conflict. I would like to warmly welcome you to the third panel discussion in the online event series on anticipating climate change and disaster displacement. The series is an activity of the cluster violent disruptions and forced migration. Today, our topic is climate induced displacement and forecast based financing in humanitarian action. In the context of the last two panels, we have been addressing the legal framework protecting climate refugees, and we have discussed the available data and models predicting climate induced displacement. Today, we are focusing on a third important topic, namely the role of humanitarian action in anticipating climate-induced displacement and turn to a more practice-oriented perspective. All three topics represent important research pillars of our institute, legal research, humanitarian data, and humanitarian action, which we seek to combine in this event. Our starting point is the observation that displacement due to disasters, including the adverse effects of climate change, is among the biggest humanitarian challenges in the 21st century. Already today, millions of people are displaced by weather and climate related hazards. This challenge needs to be addressed through investments in far-sighted development planning, disaster risk reduction and climate change adaptation, as well as, and most importantly, through global action to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. However, the role of humanitarian action is also increasingly recognized. Many of the global legal and policy frameworks, such as the Sendai Framework for Disaster Risk Reduction, the Agenda for Humanity, the UNFCCC, and the Global Compact on Refugees, emphasize also the role and importance of humanitarian action in the context of climate-induced disaster displacement, whenever displacement cannot be prevented. As a result, the importance of so-called anticipatory humanitarian action has increased substantially in the last, let's say, five years. It includes a process um, such as forecast-based financing, forecast-based action, as well as early morning, early action. Generally, these approaches are relatively new and they are still being refined constantly. However, they all aim at providing communities exposed to specific risk with the necessary support and enable early action before a disaster occurs. The focus of most anticipatory approaches has so far been on extreme weather events such as floods, storms and droughts. Our panel today seeks to explore the potentials and limitations of anticipatory humanitarian action in general and forecast-based financing in particular to tackle the challenges associated with displacement that is triggered by the effects of climate change. These include not only the more frequent occurrence of those weather events, but also long term changes of climate spurring slow onset processes like sea level rise or soil degradation, as well as secondary effects in the form of food insecurity or the intensification of violent conflict. I am very happy to introduce to you our distinguished panel. All our panelists have worked on anticipatory humanitarian action for a long time from different perspectives, academia, practical implementation and donor. Please welcome with me Lisa Thalheimer. Lisa is currently pursuing a PhD at Oxford's um, Environmental Change Institute. 
Her research focuses on quantifying the impacts of human mobility and extreme weather events, exploring the role of climate change. Together with other experts, she has written an issue brief on forecast-based financing and disaster displacement. Lisa will provide us with a general overview of the topic. Stephanie Lux. Stephanie is the coordinator of the forecast-based financing programs at German Red Cross. She is responsible for advancing work on forecast-based financing in German Red Cross's nine pilot countries, as well as for shaping the methodology at global level in cooperation with other Red Cross partners, scientists, UN agencies, and NGOs. Stephanie will give an insight into practice from the per perspective of the German Red Cross. Dominic Semmel. Dominic is currently working as a program coordinator for forecast-based action programs at Welthungerhilfe. His expertise focuses on the areas of risk and vulnerability assessments, as well as anticipatory humanitarian action. Among others, he previously worked with the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization on disaster risk reduction and climate resilience, as well as with the German Red Cross. Dominic will provide us with lessons learned and ideas from the perspective of an NGO. Last but not least, uh, Matthias Amling. Matthias is Senior Desk Officer for Humanitarian Assistance in the German Federal Foreign Office. Among others, he is responsible for the management of the portfolio in anticipatory humanitarian action and the climate change action plan. He has gained extensive experience in disaster risk reduction and humanitarian relief, for example, as coordinator for crisis monitoring and emergency response at the Welthungerhilfe or as project officer with Caritas International in the Philippines. Matthias will focus today on the funding mechanisms and bring in the donor perspectives. Before I give the floor to the speakers now, I would like to mention, as always, that we would like to keep this webinar interactive. Please post your questions and comments in the Zoom chat window. You may do so already during presentations. My colleague, Rebecca Goeke, who is with us in the room, will collect the questions and post them to the panelists. Let me now, without further ado, give the floor to Lisa. Lisa, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, I'll quickly share my screen, hoping that technology works in my favor. Right. I hope you can now see my screen. So uh, today I would like to talk about um, addressing climate related displacement um, with anticipatory action measures. And this um, kind of presentation is inspired by a bit of work I did together with IFRC and the Red Cross uh, Climate Center last year uh, during the pandemic essentially. Um, and yeah, these are essentially our lessons learned um, with the goal of bringing together academia practitioners from both the disaster world, so to say, but also humanitarian aid. We first asked ourselves like, what actually is climate related displacement? Um, and we saw that this is not, you know, a question everyone knew an answer to. So we thought we interview experts and really ask um, what the consensus um, is on this kind of topic of climate related displacement. Um, we did a lot of research and um, saw essentially also that there's a lot out there. And um, in 2020, so last year, a lot of people have been displaced by weather and climate related disasters and also by conflict and um, violence. Disaster displacement um, or climate related displacement refers to situations where people are actually forced to leave their homes or places of habitual residence um, as a result of disasters in order to avoid the impact of immediate or foreseeable natural hazards. 
And we also saw that um, it varies across countries and community what kind of impacts people actually experience from both weather and climate related events, but also from conflict and violence. And so we thought it's quite useful to put together um, the different types of human mobility in general on an axis of um, forced to voluntary movements, which you can see in figure one. So the F refers to forced um, kind of reasons why people are uh, having to move and V is for voluntary movements. So you can see on the, on the left-hand side, the refugee-like events where people have very low levels of control over the actual situation, where they go and when they move. And then there's climate displacement or climate related displacement. These are compelled and not voluntary movements. And usually people have a bit more control over the timing and the direction where they go during extreme events. And then there are migrant like events where people have essentially the highest levels of control over where they go and when they go to. Um, right. And today we would like to focus, um, as Katrin mentioned, on the climate related displacement factors and how anticipatory action can essentially help before, you know, things become a disaster and many, many people are displaced. So how can we essentially um, avoid that? Figure two also shows that on the global level, we have a lot of new displacements uh, due to conflict and due to disasters. And you can see the in the bar chart, the kind of higher bars are the ones which are due to disasters and only the, the, the lower ones are um, due to conflict. You can kind of see in the, in the timescale from 2008 to 2019 that climate and weather related disasters have actually quite taken over the amount of, well, yeah. The, the people being displaced in terms of numbers. Um, but conflict and, and violence are obviously also very important um, issues. Right. And then because um, we had, we still are having the pandemic and the impact we, we essentially asked, um, how can we reduce the impacts from climate change, poverty and compound vulnerabilities prior to you know, things becoming a disaster? And um, I thought it's quite quite nice to, to put up this, this image because there are obviously a lot of things going on at the moment with the COVID-19 pandemic, with climate change impacts, but also with conflicts, with the economy obviously going in certain countries through a recession. And we also see that kind of the disasters, all these different disasters are collaborating and potentially you know, better than, than we are. So I thought it's, it's, quite, it's quite nice to, um, to put up this kind of um, image. Right. Um, so last year, I worked a bit together with the IFRC and the Red Cross Climate Center, as mentioned, and I'm probably the most junior person on this panel, I will also mention. Um, but it's, it was really nice to, to dive deeper into forecast based financing, anticipatory action, and to also bring together the practitioners from both the disaster displacement world, but also from the humanitarian aid um, perspective, essentially. And our two outputs are an issue brief, uh, which you can see illustrated on the left hand side, and we also wrote up our um, our findings essentially in um, a manuscript which we sent to to a journal and it's now under review with uh, global environmental change, which is quite nice. Um, so the, the whole idea is essentially that we ask experts about you know what are the potentials but also the limitations of how, how can we use anticipatory action for uh, disaster displacement. And it was actually quite nice that we, we had the opportunity to talk to so many people um, because everything was shifted online last year. So a lot of people were actually willing to, to share their knowledge and um, would also really like to thank the people at um, both the Norwegian Refugee Council, um, the German Red Cross like Stephanie, who's on, on this panel, but also from across the, the Climate Center and IFRC, they've been absolutely brilliant in, in sharing their knowledge on different uh, you know limitations potentials challenges and opportunities um, how to use anticipatory action for disaster displacement so this has been a really great experience and I hope also that this knowledge um, is, is useful to you as well in, in you know your work your research um, also in your, your interest Right, so it's probably useful to also mention what actually forecast-based financing is because I alluded a lot to that term, but I haven't really given a definition. So here's the definition. Forecast-based financing essentially enables access to humanitarian funding 
before an actual disaster hits based on weather forecasts, climate forecasts. And this is then combined with risk analysis. So in other words, um, I thought it's quite nice to put it in this way that it's anticipation instead of reaction. And um, I believe the, the other three panelists will go a bit more into detail of what the actual components are. So I will just, you know, highlight um, the three components, which are the triggers, selection of actions, and then finance mechanisms. Right, so after talking to um, a lot of experts, we had about 20 experts from across the disaster displacement world, but also from um, humanitarian aid. Um, we, we put together the opportunities and, and challenges, um, yeah, which, you know, we can, we can, we have essentially um, to, to implement uh, anticipatory action for disaster displacement. Right, so I think we, we started with the, the point of, okay, where are we essentially with displacement? And we thought it's, it's very important to actually go along the lines of the displacement process. So we have four processes in, in displacement. First, the analysis of displacement risk, which are really important to look at, and then um, protection against arbitrary displacement, and also preparedness and response to displacement, as well as then more the sustainable um, um, lens, durable solutions for displacement displaced communities. And so all our opportunities and recommendations are along these four kind of bullet points for big topics, so to say. And first of all, we, we, we gather that the context is really um, important. So an important starting point in reducing humanitarian impacts of disaster displacement is actually the assessment of context specific factors that prompt it. So that is the identification of who is actually at risk of displacement or is already displaced and what will be particular at risk. So for instance, um, do people need shelter? Um, do they have appropriate housing? Do people need strengthening of roofs? What type of extreme event is likely to hit? So there are obviously differences in a flood versus a drought or cyclone. A flood is for instance, much more you know, fast impact um, versus a drought, it's much longer. So for instance, a drought could be a couple of days only and you have a much smaller window of being of, of preparing or a drought which is more long longer term um, it could be you know multiple months or even a year or two so there are obviously various different um, mechanisms um, with which you can you can uh, prepare for and then um, it's it's very important that the so-called early action protocols with with which the Red Cross um, and also IFSC are working and I think um, Stephanie is probably um, explaining that in more detail um, it, these EAPs are very context specific. So this is actually an opportunity to kind of plug in um, disaster displacement and work really with the kind of um, flexibility of EAPs um, in, in various different um, countries. And then as a second point, the protection against arbitrary displacement. Um, we came up with kind of two big opportunities, which also bear some kind of challenges. So build back better. Uh, obviously, this was under the umbrella of the 2020 um, COVID-19 pandemic, uh, building back better. And this actually suits um, the kind of uh, anticipatory action for disaster displacement um, well too, so to say, because a central principle in, in the approach of um, displacement is actually supporting people to stay uh, in their home and not for them to having to go. Um, and, you know, as long as they're actually safe um, and, you know, there's physical integrity and dignity and people are not endangered, essentially. So we can really use anticipatory action to to help people staying where they are and not being forced to move but that also means that we can after um, an event happened we can build back better in order to anticipate future extreme events occurring so that's meant by by building back better that also ties into the next point which is livelihood support livelihood support could be in order to you know strengthen the community at risk of displacement or also those who have been displaced already by previous extreme events. Um, it could be from, you know, giving out, um, uh, uh, sorry, uh, it could be from, from strengthening roofs essentially um, uh, to better housing, to, um, you know, nearby evacuation centers, all of that, or essentially um, training people, education uh, measures for people not to, to lose their jobs when, um, for instance, a cyclone or a drought hits. As a third point, we have uh, preparedness and response to displacement. 
So this kind of looks more into the window of, of actual, um, the, the kind of extreme event is hitting, what can we essentially do before that and in, in response to the extreme event. So cash is one option um, which we identified is, is one of the kind of go-to um, support mechanisms in order to prepare people to be able to move voluntarily, but also um, if, if they have, you know, losses in harvest or losses in their assets to kind of buffer that, that bit of loss they have. And as a, a fourth point, durable solutions for those who are actually displaced. Here we saw that for all communities who are already displaced, it is essential that steps should be taken to move towards durable solutions as quickly as the circumstances allow. So really looking into a sustainable um, future um, lens. An understanding and action to support durable solutions um, can be taken even prior to displacement occurring as part of um, certain uh, preparedness activities, which nicely ties into point three. We then also in the issue brief came up with um, a couple of recommendations, which we then again aligned in the, in the four uh, bullet points of analysis, protection, preparedness to durable solutions. And um, here we, we essentially see that the analysis of displacement um, risk here, it's really important that integrating the topic of displacement um, we can do that essentially by assessing the risks associated with displacement. So who is affected likely, where and what time of extreme event. And the perspective of people who have been previously displaced are, are really crucial to incorporate because these people have um, already experienced what it is like to be displaced and how that may differ from extreme event to extreme event. So from a flood to a drought, for instance, um, there are obviously differences. And these, um, these perspectives should then inform the development of anticipatory actions. As number two, protection against arbitrary displacement, um, we see um, that a lot of initiatives to protect against arbitrary displacement will actually fall outside the scope of our forecast-based financing, because this is kind of including longer-term resilience building, which is more part of disaster risk reduction um, measures, for instance. However, um, FBF um, could be used in order to address the risks that have not been managed as part of longer term processes. So kind of looking again at that window, um, which has not been covered through DRR or through, um, through long term planning before people actually get displaced. Um, that ties into number three, preparedness and response. Um, evacuation centers, um, we recommend need to be safe and a dignified place and accessible um, to all. We also recommend that including um, the perspective of host communities, but also um, obviously work uh, with host communities, uh, informal displacement sites and other um, and others beyond the area of displacement altogether. So kind of having a bit more holistic view on that. And number four, durable solutions for displaced communities really, really uh, includes cooperation, partnerships and dialogues with those who are actually in the disaster displacement community, but also those from the humanitarian sector, those working in academia, those who are practitioners. And as, an, as a final um, example, um, we presented the, the issue brief, which I I guess gave a short summary of it um, just now um, in the Climate Red Summit last year in the fall. Um, and here it was really interesting to, to speak to, to various different um, practitioners um, who were online, who had you know, the chance to ask uh, questions and this further kind of refined the, um, the, the approach taken in the, in the issue brief, which has now been further taken on um, uh, through the IFRC, but also the Red Cross uh, Climate Center, as well as um, German Red Cross and other uh, humanitarian um, uh, practitioners. So um, I group the, the key takeaways from, from this very you know, short and, and kind of summary um, overview into three points. Um, so the key takeaway messages are practitioners need to be able to decide in a timely manner when and where to act. Decisions are based obviously on anticipated, anticipated risk and impact of disaster displacement. And for impact forecasting, there is a need for adequate exposure data. And that is really not given in every part of this world. Data scarcity is really an, a big issue here. 
and also to plan the uh, interventions in a reliable way and ad hoc finance mechanisms that actually recognize disaster displacement, as that is also what we've seen that disaster displacement is not explicitly um, put into various legal and policy documents. And with that, I would like to end my short presentation. Thank you very much, um, Lisa, for providing us with this very comprehensive overview and um, for sharing your recommendations. I think it will be interesting now if we listen to um, Stephanie and Dominic um, to hear in how far um, you are already kind of working with these recommendations um, and, and how far they play a role in the project. Um, and therefore, um, and I see there are no questions in the chat so far. Um, I would like to hand over immediately to Stephanie and maybe um, just take a minute um, to um, let um, you know or let the audience know that um, you may please post your questions um, in the chat already during presentations and we will collect them afterwards and post them um, to the panelists. So please go ahead and um, post your questions in the chat. Stephanie, please. Hi, so I'm Stephanie. I was introduced. I had the forecast-based financing work at German Red Cross. Um, Lisa has already very well introduced forecast-based financing. I just want to highlight two things which also relate a bit to what forecast-based financing can do and cannot do, uh, which I think we will discuss later. So one thing, as Lisa said, it's based on forecasts, right? So at the moment, as, as she said, we use it mainly for extreme weather events. Um, this is very important when we talk about climate-induced displacement because it only covers parts of the climate-induced displacement. And then the other part is that um, at least as we um, handle it, and I think as also Start Network handles it and the other actors, it's for extreme events, right? So it's for events out of the ordinary that would normally cause international humanitarian assistance. And this is actually a huge problem because if we talk about climate induced and climate change that these extreme events um, that we call extreme, they are happening more and more often. And this also is um, then a very, how do you say, it's a, it's a thin line between where does you know, disaster response and FBF start and where does resilience building end, you know, because for if something occurs every year, then FBF and humanitarian assistance are definitely not the best solution to address it because um, it's a regular occurrence and it's um, rare. That's why I also want to highlight, I mean, on this panel, we are humanitarian actors and the, um, the government, but more in a sense of funding as humanitarian actors, there is a lot of responsibility in this whole um, addressing disaster, climate-induced displacement that lies with the governments. Um, and we have to make that very clear. And also, um, when you know, uh, when Lisa talks about her recommendations, that is true. That some of that we can do as humanitarians, but a lot of it, um, you know, like evacuation, for example, lies in the responsibility of the government and we can support, but we should also never forget when we talk about it. Um, so um, this was mentioned already, so I will go right in. So where we as FBF, uh, when we talk about climate, we often talk about also climate change and um, how does it relate to disasters. So Today, um, I think in most presentations, I'll have a little excourse, <laughs> but we talk about disaster um, related displacement, um, mostly when we talk about FBF and displacement. Um, if you see, um, you know, the we have the World Disaster Report as a Red Cross, very interesting uh, literature if you have the time. But in last year's World Disaster Report, for example, we saw that of the what we no longer call natural disasters, but disasters caused by natural hazards. Um, so could also be tsunamis, volcano, and so on. But 83% of them are actually uh, caused by extreme weather events and climate related. So something that talking about disasters um, with a natural, natural in parentheses cause, we can address a lot of it with FBF, but not all of it as it is related to displacement. And you can see um, from the numbers that these um, weather related disasters or extreme weather events um, affect a lot of people. 
Um, so I have more than the practice examples, also some general <laughs> considerations that I wanted to share with you. Um, so again, we talk about climate induced disasters here, but it's very important that we keep in mind that with anticipatory action, we are talking about the ones that we can actually forecast or more the extreme weather. There is displacement and especially the bad displacement, the, the, the durable displacement um, where livelihoods are destroyed in a long-term manner that is caused by climate change impacts that are not really extreme weather, you know, um, desertification, um, sea level rise. And there we must be honest, that's where the development banks need to come in, that's where governments need to um, invest massively in mitigation and climate change adaptation and where of course we all have to contribute to um, this phenomena at least not worsening but this is not something where we as humanitarians with forecast based financing can make um, much of a difference if we'll have sea level rise or desertification um, that's not something we can address with FBF, but it is something that urgently needs to be addressed because it concerns more and more people around the world. Where we come in and when we talk about climate change um, is that more and more extreme weather events are increasing in um, frequency and in intensity. Yeah, so we have floods that come more often in a more extreme manner, for example, or heat, extreme heat that increases, extreme cold waves. So we have these extreme weather events that uh, always kind of are key of our mandate as humanitarian organizations that are happening with increased frequency and have increasingly drastic effects on the population. And there, as Lisa explained, this is where FBF wants to make a difference by reducing the impacts of these extreme weather events. And then some general consideration, I put it in parentheses, but in German, especially, often we, um, we, we translate displacement with vertreibung, um, which is a very um, negative word, right? Um, so we have to be careful that displacement, as we discuss it here, and as it is discussed by a lot of organizations who collect the statistics on it, is not necessarily always a bad thing. Lisa already went, part, uh, went partly into this. I'll go it more into it. But for us, um, if you look, for example, um, I'm always astonished if you look at the data of the International Disaster Monitoring Center. So they, they will say, oh, 220 was a horrible year for Bangladesh. Um, Four million people were displaced. And as a humanitarian, if I then look at these numbers and then I see that 3.8 million were evacuated when the big floods and cyclones hit last year. And that's actually for me, if that works well, if there is dignified situations in the shelters, if people can go back, if they are well while they are in the shelters, then that's good displacement. That's what we've been working on for as humanitarians and with the governments for decades, that people are brought to safety before an extreme event hits. This is what saves life. This is what can save livelihoods. We get to that. So just be, when you look at the statistics, bear in mind that not every we are not against we are not for preventing displacement when it's for example displacement like this right um because we do want people to be safe from extreme events and um this is something we have really invested massively <laughs> in that this evacuation functions and now it's more about making it function better so when I talk about FBF and extreme weather, <laughs> we have different topics I would like to address. So in different aspects we could talk about. So one is you already have displacement. Um, we have this, for example, in Cox's Bazar in um, Bangladesh. So you already have a context of displacement, which has nothing to do with climate induced or, or extreme weather, but it's, it's very crowded. It has very different conditions. So if we work, for example, in Cox's Bazar, Bangladesh. For Bangladesh, we have early actions for cyclones and for floods, but they were developed, let's say, for a more standard exposed community in Bangladesh. They were not ex uh, developed for Cox Bazaar. So as uh, Lisa explained, when we choose our triggers, they are not only based, for example, for a cyclone on the wind speed. 
they are also based on how poor is the population, how strong is the infrastructure, how exposed is the community's location and so on. And then you can imagine that, of course, a storm that in an average um, community in Bangladesh maybe doesn't cause much impact because it doesn't have much wind speed um, can already cause complete destruction in Cox Bazaar if you look at the picture of the housing, you know. And so we need to take this into account when we develop the trigger. So a much weaker event that is not extreme anywhere else in the country can already be like a disaster in um, the context of displacement, depending on infrastructure and so on. So it, it, depend, um, it impacts us in the trigger development, but it also really, uh, really limits what we can do as an early action. So for example, um, for cyclones in Bangladesh, our main early action is to support evacuation. So the government has a very, very successful evacuation program in Bangladesh. It's one of the most renowned in the world um, for a developing country of that income bracket. Um, but what we saw is that people are tired of <laughs> evacuating. You know, they don't want to evacuate anymore because it happens quite a bit and they have to leave behind their assets, their livestock and so on. So they are worried that somebody might take it while they are away or that they run away in the wind and rain. So they don't evacuate because of the fear of loss of assets in the absence and also because often the conditions in the shelters are not ideal. So there is no food, there is not enough water and so on. So our early action is to support the evacuation. And you can imagine <laughs> that this, you can't, you can't evacuate a, a refugee or a displacement camp where there are 100,000 people. Um, where would you evacuate them to? How would you do that? So just as an example that um, we have to really reconsider also how we, which early actions we can do when we talk about context of existing displacement. Um, the other um, displacement we have talked about, and this is also what Lisa has talked about, is the displacement as a result of extreme weather. Um, so there, this we can anticipate to an extent because we can anticipate the extreme weather as such. And then, as I said before, this displacement as a result of extreme weather or in anticipation of extreme weather, if we talk about evacuations, this can be good displacement if it is temporary, say, signified in a case of an evacuation, for example, right? So what we with early actions can do is to anticipate that a lot of people will move to the shelters, for example, as I just explained, look that there are dignified conditions that people can take their livestock, that we help transport livestock and assets and so on so that they can keep safe. This then also, if they can keep their assets safe, for example, helps them to, if they had damage to the house and so on, to recover better and to stay in the location where they were after the extreme weather hit. And this links to the second point, the possibility of return. I think that's really a, a big one. And Lisa mentioned this. So for us, this is the crucial thing, right? Um, if you displace for, let's say for a flood in Bangladesh you displace up to four weeks, um, then our main work is to ensure you are in dignified conditions and you don't lose all your assets during that time. But what if the flood completely destroys your home, you know, and all your crops, then you are without an income and without a home, and that's where we often see then people displacing to the urban centers and never coming back because they have no livelihoods left and no housing left. So this is really where, of course, again, we need the long-term investments because what helps is more stable infrastructures is dams and dikes, for example. Um, but as FBF, what we can try to do, and we do this, for example, in the Philippines and also in Mozambique, um, is we help people strengthen their houses when a cyclone or typhoon approaches so that there is less likelihood of the house being completely destroyed. We also help people to bring their crops and their animals to safety. So there is less likelihood of them losing all their assets so that they have something when they come back, right? Um, and in Bangladesh during the evacuation, um, I don't think I have time to go into this um, in detail, but 
Um, we provide, for example, cash so people don't have to take up, sell all their assets for the long evacuation and don't have to take up high interest loans, which again then helps if the displacement was a result of extreme weather, first to come through this period of displacement well and second to return back and to keep living um, in the community where they are from. But the prevention of complete destruction, um, I said we strengthen houses. Yes, we do, but there is of course only so much um, FBF can do. Um, so really again, a call on governments and advocacy to also invest more in the long-term mitigation solutions. And then this is just my last point because um, we are talking about it we are looking into it, but we have not much experience yet. Um, I think Stark Network has a bit more experience already on this, is how can we anticipate displacement as such when it's not linked to extreme weather? Um, I think last week you heard um, Alexander Kierum um, from the Refugee Council who works on this, um, has very interesting models. There are different UNHCR, IDMC, they're all working on models to predict displacement. Um, Unfortunately for us, these models for our approach are not yet specific enough because what they can do is they tell you, okay, next year in Afghanistan, we predict there will be a million more displaced than usual, you know? Um, and that is super, super interesting for humanitarian organizations to plan our operations and so on, but it's not necessarily the level of detail we would need for anticipatory action where we would actually need to know, okay, where will this happen and when will it happen so that we can act target, in a targeted manner. And um, But there is more and more progress on this, so definitely something we are looking into. Um, we are looking into it also in Honduras, Guatemala, for example, where you kind of, you know, you can anticipate that more people will move through these countries depending a bit on the policies of the US. And we are also preparing not only for the displacement going out, but also the returnees. Um, so that's something we're looking into. As Red Cross, I have to say, you probably know our principles of impartiality, neutrality. And this is also a very tricky area because often displacement when it's not weather related can be related to violence, political developments and so on. And for us then as Red Cross to come out and say, for example, we think this government will soon expel this group um, is of course uh, very difficult. So we also have to find ways um, how to address this. And with this, I hand over to Dominic. Okay, um, Stephanie, thank you so much for raising um, these important um, questions and also um, yeah, giving us um, a little bit of a warning with regards to statistics and the pitfalls of statistics. Um, I think it will be very helpful and will be helpful for the discussion um, also. And since um, we, um, we are, have not so much time left and we want to um, keep some time um, for the discussion, I hand over to Dominic um, immediately and would like to ask you to keep your presentation um, as short <laughs> as possible. I'm sorry about this. I would like to allow for at least 30 minutes of um, discussion and towards the end of um, our panel's discussion. Okay, Dominic, the floor is yours. Thank you. Great. Thanks. And I have a presentation as well, but uh, I will try to, to cut some of the examples or at least be a bit faster on um, what I'm talking about. So yeah, thanks again for having me and thanks also to the previous presenters to already basically outline all of the challenges we face by the climate induced displacement and uh, especially by reacting to it. Um, and I also try not to double them too much and rather really focus on an NGO perspective and if and if yes, uh, how we could uh, use anticipatory action to, to tackle the challenges brought by climate-induced displacement. Um, and I guess you, um, you already might sense it. Also for us, we are not quite there yet and also not sure how to get there. How can we really use forecast-based action for, um, or, or other forms of anticipatory action in this uh, um, uh, field? 
anyway, um, I hope the session can shed light a bit on, on these aspects and maybe also inform us a bit on, on how to proceed and include climate displacement better in our programs. And I would first uh, give you an overview on different forms of anticipatory action and what challenges we face and opportunities to see in the different approaches um, regarding climate-induced displacement. Um, in general, we have two approaches to anticipatory action um, within Welthungerhilfe. Uh, the one is a decision-based approach and the other one is a trigger-based approach. And to start with the decision-based approach, um, we use the start fund anticipation window through the start network. Uh, in short, basically, if you don't know that, the START network is a collaboration, a close network of several international and national NGOs, which also self-manage, really um, self-manage our own quite large response funds, which can be activated by members themselves, and also the decision on, on allocation of funds and who does what and when and where is done by the members themselves. And since I guess three years, please Matthias, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, we also have an anticipation window within the start fund where members are not just able to react to crisis, but also be able to raise and so-called alert in anticipation after we get an early warning if we really predict um, impacts of a, of a hazard to be quite um, imminent. And also the same procedure, if and such an alert is raised and accepted, the START network members themselves decide on, on who and when this will uh, be implemented. And this is then often used for actually early actions, but also for fast and, and early responses. And the second one is the trigger-based approach. And since that's the forecast-based action program, I spent a bit more time on it, but not too much, don't worry. Um, yeah, it, because it's our uh, forecast-based action program where we implement really long-term trigger-based mechanisms, which are then really quite similar to the forecast-based financing approach by the Red Cross, only um, brought into an NGO context. Um, and we do that since 2017. Um, we established a program in Madagascar. Um, and the, uh, last year, we were able to uh, scale it up to Zimbabwe and Kenya. And uh, yeah. Uh, it's a trigger-based program, as I said, and it addresses drought-induced food insecurity, so a really, by climate change, affected slow-onset disaster, let's say like that. Um, and how will we be doing that? Um, we develop a, this trigger-based uh, trigger forecasting model, um, which is based on different biophysical indicators, predicting an agricultural drought, actually, in the, in the target areas, combined with an impact-based forecasting, approach data um, using vulnerability and risk data from the respective population to actually predict is the drought also influencing the food insecurity and will it lead to a large-scale disaster or mid-scale disaster. And then if a trigger is met and food insecurity actually predicted, a so-called early action protocol, also similar then by the Red Cross, they are activated um, and we try to do that or we're doing that before um, the actual loss of the harvest and before um, within the, the lean season food prices or food insecurity will peak. And in general that shall actually minimize the impact of hazards and minimize the loss of the whole livelihood um, reducing of the humanitarian assistance afterwards. And uh, because it's quite abstract I guess a uh, short example from this year actually um, this year our model in the north of Madagascar predicted large-scale losses of harvest and um, a resulting food insecurity later this year in the north. Um, and so we are uh, implementing actually uh, unconditional cash transfers to the most vulnerable beginning before the harvest and then continue them up to the lean season to really steer negative coping strategies, prevent negative disturbing uh, strategies and prevent losses of livelihoods. And that's also, I think, something which is quite important if we now talk about climate-induced displacement, because up from these, um, looking from a perspective from the slow onset disasters, loss of livelihood is mainly then the real uh, reason for uh, uh, displacement. Yeah, the question is actually, we now have, are these two approaches fit 
to account for different forms of, of displacement and especially climate induced displacement. And is it still like valid if we look from this perspective of slow onset disasters like droughts? Um, therefore, the next and, and, and also last slide. Um, yeah, from this perspective, um, when we first talk about decision, decision based, or, or another point <laughs> I forgot to raise, um, yeah, because we do not just talk about this, this uh, the immediate impact of, of large scale disasters, but if we look at climate variability and climate change, actually, we are really looking at a shift in climate patterns with really endangers livelihoods um, of the people who are not then maybe that resilient to drought, droughts or, or dry spells. And uh, yeah, people livelihoods and agricultural systems would then be lost due to the climate change, the climate changing climate patterns, and of course, in addition to then increasing numbers and intents of, of disasters. Yeah, but back to the decision based and the trigger based approach and how they can tackle climate induced displacement. Um, and uh, where is the opportunity maybe for them to come in? And if we look, for example, at our decision based approach, which is then really taken ad hoc and ad hoc uh, decided what is, is needed. There we really see some examples for, for certain sudden displacement disasters where this decision-based anticipa anticipation, anticipation window uh, might come in and be able to address displacement already there or at least the needs of, of already displaced people. Um, I have a short, small example because until now, um, attempts to use this anticipation window for displacement were rather done in um, relation to conflict by other start network partners. Um, for example, the latest attempt was to use it uh, within the Ethiopia crisis in Tigray in the north, uh, where after uh, an attack by the government, um, the, we expected displacement of large scale, uh, of yeah, in a large scale, and there. The plan was to provide shelter and hygiene kits, and yeah, similar attempt to was were done in Syria and also in Iraq. However, um, often people's movements are hard to predict, and especially within conflict, it's hard to really say when and where people are moving or why and why not they're moving. And also, as we said before, this is highly sensitive data, not so critical, and maybe rather useful uh, would it then be uh, in terms of natural hazards uh, one example there is for example last week we had a, a volcano outbreak in drc where we saw uh, evacuations or even displacements to to rwanda and the surrounding districts um, however in general i would say these these their yeah, decision-based approaches are then also rather fit for these refugee-like events um, and not so much for long-term protection, long-term loss of, of climate, uh, uh, of livelihoods in terms of climate displacement. If we not look at people already displaced or, or rather look at displacement, climate-induced displacement as a secondary impact of disasters, there where we might uh, can discuss forecast-based action comes in because in general, of course, it shall prevent the livelihood loss of reoccurring droughts um, in terms of climate change. However, until now, we really haven't thought of including displacement um, as, a co as a coping strategy. We want directly to prevent or to steer. But of course, since our early actions are there to minimize the impact on livelihoods, that would be a secondary income. But um, and I think I have to really agree with uh, Stephanie there. We really, if we really look at the long term, these sinking changes in climate and successive losses of agricultural livelihoods, I also doubt that forecast based action can yeah, prevent the displacements over a long time. And this is rather um, yeah, a task, a really, really a challenge for disaster risk reduction, climate change adaptation, and resilience work. However, the key lessons from our first experiences are that these two, and to really address this long-term impact of climate change, these two or these different approaches need to be linked way more. That especially after we have, for example, the forecast-based action intervention, um, it is really closely connected to 
resilience measures, DRR measures afterwards, in the aftermath of the crisis. So people are not left alone and forced to leave their homes, even if, 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 if within the large disaster they were widely protected, but afterwards, because of the changing climate patterns, they are forced to uh, to leave. Yeah. And I guess um, I can stop there already and hand over to, to um, Matthias. Thanks. Thank you, Dominic. And I will actually really hand over right away <laughs> to Matthias um, to give his presentation and then we can start the discussion. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I'll also start sharing my presentation if that works. And I am uh, well aware, let me see, here we go. I'm well aware that we are over time and I'll try to keep things short. Uh, it's a bit, uh, everything has been said, but not for everyone yet. Uh, I think we are working on similar uh, issues. So I really will, uh, will try uh, just to underline some points, uh, but uh, not make the same points again. I think that was already a very uh, dense and interesting uh, bit of inputs that we had from our previous speakers. Um, maybe just to may zoom out a little bit for the uh, Federal Foreign Office responsible for humanitarian assistance in general, we have an overall goal about disaster risk reduction. So uh, to address humanitarian challenges, uh, of natural hazards and climate change ahead uh, of the actual disaster by interrelated approaches. And you'll see why I start that because it interlinks risk reduction preparedness on the one hand, that's uh, kind of the everyday job. It uh, also uh, uses this paradigm shift that we were talking about um, to do a forward looking humanitarian assistance. So anticipatory action, forecast based financing, uh, develop, develop these uh, approaches and really use a specific window of opportunity. I'll come to that. But also as a third pillar, maybe uh, to, to, to name it that like that protection uh, to the needs of people displaced. So disaster displacement. And it's interesting, we talk about climate change induced displacement here a lot. I would most of the times talk about disaster displacement, even though they are very closely interlinked, but um, disaster displacement, yeah, it's, 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 it's not to separate from the effects of the climate change, but that's more what I think uh, anticipatory action can address. Then here uh, you are always told don't use uh, too complex uh, uh, graphics if you don't explain them well. Uh, well, I'll explain just a little bit of it, but in the end, I think disaster risk financing or anticipatory action, all of that, uh, we, are, we are talking about different time scales and dif different kind of windows of, of opportunity. And that was uh, mainly what my, uh, the, the, the other people were talking about also when we said some of the solutions are not the solutions for forecast based financing. If you look here, uh, we have uh, the, the red and the uh, turquoise or what it is uh, on, on the left that's all ahead of the disaster blue and green uh, are after is this a disaster and we don't talk too much on that now but um, disaster risk reduction in red that's crucial to be implemented by governments by states. Uh, and by humanitarian actors um, to really see that generally risks for disasters are reduced and thereby also disaster displacement risks obviously are reduced. Then we have a specific window of opportunity where we know, okay, now we can see a specific disaster coming and we can address that if we don't have this resilience yet that we want. We always want to have resilient societies and we always want to do DRR at its best, but there will be a residual risk. The better we do uh, disaster risk reduction, the less. But to address this res residual risk, we can use the forecast-based financing and subtory action. And then comes all uh, that is after displacement. And that's also important, but I'll not uh, go into detail now, just to maybe give a bit of an overview on that. Um, we also heard already that um, displacement is a lot also about legal and policy documents and these things. It's not only about humanitarian assistance or protection. Um, so one of the things that we uh, as uh, the German Federal Foreign Office are supporting uh, besides together with the development ministry, of course, supporting generally the Sendai framework uh, for disaster risk reduction, but specifically uh, working on how can we uh, put, and that's the nice, uh, 
no, first I, I'll start um, with the platform on disaster displacement. That was an initiative that said, uh, we have to take care about people who cross borders because of disasters and they don't count as refugees. They don't count as internal displaced people because they cross the border. So they, there need to be some uh, regi regime of protection protection but not only that it's also and that's why uh, it's here the overall objective objective of the platform on disaster displacement is also to prevent and reduce disaster displacements displacement risks in the countries of origin and i think that's the link that we have between something on the policy level like the nonsense protection agenda and the platform on disaster displacement to uh, what we can do with forecast based financing anticipatory action and that also translate into other documents i was talking about the sendai framework the sendai framework has different uh, documents um, or reports on putting words into action how can we actually make all the commitments that we uh, agreed to in the Sunday framework a reality and one of the words into actions was specific on disaster displacement and that says apply anticipatory preparedness approaches such as forecast based financing um, because you can reduce potential potential displacement or other negative impacts so I'll really not go through all the points that we had about uh, how important it is to do the analysis of risk I think FBF anticipatory reaction does a strong risk analysis that helps also to understand the dis displacement risks and maybe just as one little excourse we were talking about the IDMC data and that's highly interesting the newest data says like uh, three quarter of the displacement is a uh, disaster displacement uh, and then of that it's extreme weather events with I think uh, again from the 30 million it's 14 million uh, 14 million storms 14 million floods but 300 no, 32,000 drought and i don't really don't understand that and i had no chance yet to really discuss this with the idmc people maybe uh, lisa or anyone else in the call can explain it to me that is something where we maybe have to kind of clarify a bit on our understanding of disaster displacement and what data we use where but generally we have to analyze the risk that's the first part then we have to try to prevent obviously prevent displacement and reduce displacement risk and then we have to mitigate the impact of displacement and thereby support if possible a quicker recovery uh, or quicker solutions that goes together with the durable solutions uh, of displacement i will actually not do all of that i think most of that has been said maybe only to enter now uh, what was promised to talk a bit about um, financing mechanisms this mapping uh, and thanks to stephanie that's not mine that's the uh, uh, from the world disaster report really a good read if you find time to read more than 300 pages um, that is all the countries that currently have anticipatory action approaches uh, projects ongoing of different of the ifrc of the start network world food program fao uh, whh we were uh, hearing about um, all of those it really grew in the last five years and it is it is very inspiring to see that we have lots of hazards like you see on the left uh, uh, that can be uh, predicted and can be forecasted and therefore can be um, approached with anticipatory action we have a lot of countries where we have these approaches and uh, as gffo uh, we wanted to make sure that in all pillars of the humanitarian assistance uh, there's a possibility to finance anticipatory humanitarian action as we were seeing in the beginning we need the forecast we need the plan but we also need the financing connected to it otherwise we can't work ahead of the disaster and therefore um, as stephanie was presenting focus based action uh, by the draft by the disaster relief and emergency uh, disaster relief emergency fund is one of the possibilities that's linked to uh, all uh, red cross red crescent societies that develop early action protocols then like dominic said uh, the start network anticipation window that's actually already nearly five years old uh, dominic so 2016 it was uh, open as an uh, anticipation window that is specific because it's not trigger based but decision based uh, but also uh, the OCHA Central Emergency uh, Relief Fund um, Response Fund. I always confuse the draft and the surf surface response. Central Emergency Response Fund that now has anticipatory action plans in, uh, I believe, already 11 pilot countries. And they have triggered and they take then a kind of a collaborative uh, anticipatory action of different UN agencies and others uh, 
to a scale because uh, you can use a lot that has been built before uh, with those. So that's these are three examples. They are not the only ones. There are other possibilities. And we also believe that we need really a diversity. It's not a one size fits all solution. We need a diversity of possibilities to finance anticipatory action. That might include also linking other finances. We were just, uh, discussing about climate finance and uh, all of these things, linking other finances to, to uh, tap into. But um, th those are the ones that uh, produced really extensive evidence and uh, compelling evidence that anticipatory action in general works. And then to come back uh, to the disaster displacement, I think, I mean, there are very easy examples like like the Mongolia Zoot. If uh, we have the possibility to predict, and Zoot is not a sudden onset, it's really rather, I mean, kind of a, a medium. I, I see, good that, that I see Stephanie because she's shaking her head. She can uh, uh, correct me, but uh, you have the, quite a bit of time for early actions. And in this time, uh, if you provide uh, uh, hay and fodder, if you can distribute veterinary kits and all of that, you can reduce uh, the need for people to then uh, be displaced to, uh, to the vicinity of uh, the urban centers to uh, get their livelihoods. And similarly, um, if you just have like we saw with the uh, surf um, allocations, uh, anticipatory action allocations in Bangladesh, if you have uh, just places to, to um, one, uh, be safe, stay safe with you and your family. Second, uh, have some place to waterproof, uh, have a waterproof storage for your documentation and these things. That's also of seeds. That's really important to start again and to, as Stephanie said, uh, use the kind of good displacement, the evacua evacuation as a short term solution, actually, and then return back home. And I think I only had another slide that shows uh, all the portfo pilot portfolio of the surf that we will not go through. And I'll stop here um, to open it up for questions and very interested in a lively discussion. Thanks. Thank you, Matthias, and sorry for, for making you rush, but I, I think it's um, very important that we um, now also offer the audience the possibility to um, ask questions. And I think um, all of you raised a number of very important um, points and issues. Um, I have also noted down a couple of questions um, that would interest me, for example, with respect to data availability. I think all of you um, touched upon this um, topic also um, with respect to the triple nexus and um, the um, the link um, to other um, actions um, in the field of um, climate change and um, disaster displacement. Um, but I would like to give um, now Rebecca the word. Um, I think we have um, three questions from the audience and um, Rebecca, it would be nice if you could summarize um, for us and um, then you can just um, choose um, who would like to answer which question. Yeah, thank you, Katrin, and thanks to the audience. Um, we have several questions. Uh, one was already answered by uh, Stephanie. It was a very specific one uh, directly to her. Um, but then we also have a few um, that you can pick. I think um, one is also going to Stephanie concerning governmental cooperation, asking about uh, linking um, forecast based finance uh, with ex ex existing social safety nets uh, in um, by, by governance in um, in crisis places. Um, maybe also giving some examples if you have. Maybe also uh, Dominic has some examples for it um, on how cooperation works well. And then uh, another set of questions is about um, well, interesting uh, cumul cumulative impact of climate change. For instance, if you have heat waves, droughts, water shortages all at the same time, um, how do you consider them in the FBF approaches? And if so, <laughs> another question, um, how about the data um, um, to have these preconditions um, if, you, if you consider um, all of them uh, together? how what data do you think is already there or what would be necessary um, and there is um, the question that links up to it on uh, migration decisions that are also in itself very complex i'm not sure who can answer this best um, but if you have migration it always um, the, the question is by somebody anonymous 
um, uh, these are highly complex decisions and always of a multidimensional nature. So what does that make um, for a prediction uh, of climate change and use displacement? What, uh, how do you uh, account for that also in your approaches that um, migration is not just due to one heat wave or one event, a single event, temporary event? And then there is one last question by Katharina Hamid, who asks about the interconnection between humanitarian assistance and long-term de development, resilience, disaster risk reduction, and climate change adoption. Um, how can this interconnection be strengthened? And she's hinting here to the nexus debate, triple nexus debate. Um, that is the third block of questions, so to say. Uh, I'm not sure who is the best to approach peace <laughs> and development questions here. Um, but I think maybe starting with Stephanie on the governmental question uh, and then moving on to interconnected displacement and cumulative climate change. Yes. So as I understand, the government question is about using social safety nets or social protection systems that are in place. So um, there have been tries. Um, so as Lisa also mentioned, in some uh, contexts, we distribute cash to uh, reduce the impact so that people don't have to sell their assets or don't lose their livelihood. Um, and of course, if you want to scale up cash distribution using the social safety nets that exist in a country, are a very good way because then you already have like the transferal mechanisms, you have the data, uh, ideally you even have the most vulnerable um, already identified. For us as humanitarian actor, there is several difficulties. One in the countries we work on, they are often not the ones with the most elaborate uh, social safety nets. Um, and two, if there are social safety nets, um, they need to be accepted by the population and they need to target the most vulnerable. So for example, we're looking into it in the Philippines and Bangladesh and Lesotho. Uh, in the Philippines, for an example, uh, an, a problem for us was that it's for families with school-aged children mainly. It has been now adapted in COVID times, but of course we don't only target families with school-aged children. You know, there are also other vulnerable. So how to use this, how to adapt these systems, it often goes beyond our means as humanitarian actors, but there are organizations like FAO, for example, who really work massively on this. And um, also um, there have been experiences in using it for drought, for example, in Kenya and um, also Eastern Africa, both by the Red Cross and by FAO. And maybe for the other questions, I let the others go first. <laughs> I'm actually happy to answer the migration decision one, um, which I think is a very good question. Um, so I think a bit of, of context. We we have we have a lot of migration. It's something completely normal. Everyone loves to migrate. I'm a migrant. I'm from Germany originally. I'm now in the UK. I'm a migrant because of educational purposes, not necessarily because of climate change, though. Obviously, the weather the weather today is nice, but usually it's rainy. So there's not a lot of compelling reasons for me to go to the UK because of the weather. Anyhow, um, so migration migration decisions are multi-causal, multi-dimensional. Um, I think what's really important here is that not every extreme event leads people to, to go places. It can also entrap people. But also what's important is that not every extreme event is made more frequent or less frequent or, you know, whatsoever by anthropogenic climate change. So there's a whole science which looks into if there's a link between extreme events and uh, anthropogenic climate change or not, and by how far has that become more frequent? Why is that relevant? Because you have um, climate finance mechanisms, which then could you know, jump on board. But there is no distinctive um, direct causal link between anthropogenic climate change and people migrating, people going, people being entrapped. This is, we, we don't have the, the observational data to actually make a scientific conclusion on that. We can say, okay, this is multi-causal, multi-dimensional, but really looking into disentangling these very various different drivers in the absence of climate change is something, uh, or in absence of you know attributing that to climate change, this is something which has been done. But looking really into the direct causal links of climate change, I would be very, very cautious um, about that. 
Um, but well, the question is also um, about the roles of local knowledge in current FBF approaches and that. So as far as I know, this is all very, very new as, as I think all the panelists have, have pointed out. And so I think there's, there's much more, you know, which is currently undergoing as well as on the compound event uh, question. So the cumulative uh, various different extreme events coming together. This is also being looked at, especially from the climate science um, side of things. So the climate community, um, which is now really um, looking into developing um, better models into um, you know, the statistical characterization of these events. We actually have a lot of uh, data scarcity in, in parts of Eastern Africa where there are a lot of heat waves occurring. But the problem is we don't have the actual data to capture that. So there's a disaster database called EMDAT and EMDAT it does an amazing job of recording um, extreme events and how many people are affected and you know, what kind of um, assets are lost. But what they don't do is actually recording heat waves. And that's the, the kind of extreme event which is, you know, which impacts people most. So there's a huge knowledge gap in, in, in that, I would say. And with that, I, I stop my enthusiastic talk. Matthias or Dominic, would you like to also pick on one or two of the questions posed? Yes, maybe I can. Or oh, Dominic, do you want to go first? Yeah, actually, yes, because I have to, to, I can add something to what Lisa just said and to the same question, because the question was also a bit about um, what knowledge gap we have on, on the ground and, and, and what knowledge actually can, can be used and what local, local knowledge can be used. And actually, that's hard, difficult in terms of displacement. Um, on the one hand, uh, our, our approach, or also the Red Cross approach, really lives from this connection to the community, the connection to the, to the regional level. It really, um, it really lives from together with the community asking and discovering what are or what would coping strategies be, what would you do in which situation, and finding out what actually would help in terms of early warning. And also, of course, transferring the warning and the knowledge of, of, of those to the community. We haven't, yeah, honestly, we haven't actually thought about, okay, how can we maybe ask or, or use knowledge about displacement or displacement plans into it? And, and from first impression, I would doubt to ask something like that because that's really the last resort and a complete loss of, of livelihood which makes you migrate or which makes you, you a refugee um, is not actually the real first step of a planning to be prepared for a disaster only really last resort and that's actually a good, good point I will take home yeah thank you Dominic Matthias yes um, I'll try to to give some thoughts on uh, Katarina's question on uh, the, the nexus or the, the linkages. Um, I think it's crucial. And I think, um, as I tried to say in the presentation, we always kind of, it's, it's cascading. We try to build resilience, development uh, cooperation, but also countries themselves. And we, we try uh, then in this to have general uh, disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management by governments, but also supported by, uh, by the um, international community or different, different actors. And I think already there, uh, we were talking about uh, legal and policy documents. It's hi highly important if we talk about displacement itself, that this place, uh, thinking about displacement is integrated in these uh, documents. You have to integrate displacement risk into the disaster risk management planning on country level or on regional level. We had just uh, had the example of the volcano uh, in, in, in uh, DRC, uh, where people had to flee for a short time uh, cross border. And that was in, in this region, there are policies that allow for short-term disaster displacement to another country. Highly important, all of that. That's kind of the, 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 this policy level. And then the disaster risk reduction or disaster risk management in general can reduce, of course, vulnerabilities. As we were hearing in uh, Stephanie's um, talk about the uh, Bangladesh um, refugee situation uh, for, of the Rohingyas, of course, the more vulnerable, uh, the faster you get any event to become a disaster. So disaster risk reduction in general will always also reduce displacement risk. Um, 
but you can also specifically um, analyze it better. It's not the same to be at risk of displacement than to be generally at risk of a disaster. Specific groups of people are more at risk and so on. So I think all of that, we have to, to, to include the thinking and the analysis uh, in, into our actions. And then we have, of course, to link, and that's not only true for disaster displacement, but true for all the questions around resilience building, uh, disaster risk reduction, um, forecast-based financing, and anticipatory action, humanitarian assistance, recovery, and so on. We have to, to complement uh, efforts. We have to understand who is doing what well, who can, um, I mean, in the nexus, the, the idea is to, to have a shared analysis and then have to uh, have to have kind of um, shared objectives as well, where to go. Not necessarily the goal that everyone is doing everything or that there are specific mandates and specific expertise as well, but uh, to, to have uh, collective outcomes as they call it, um, that's necessary to do better collaborative planning and kind of better collaborative or a better collaboration and partnership leads me a bit to another question that I will not have the time, I guess, to, to fully answer, but um, about uh, what are NGOs able to do on the ground and is everyone doing uh, their own thing? Uh, no, no, I, I think that's at least what we try with all these um, initiatives um, and we have uh, you can see uh, just uh, right above uh, Stephanie looks uh, the anticipation hub sign. That's one of the go-to places. Also, if you uh, would ever wonder where the issue brief that Lisa was talking about is to find, uh, check out the anticipation hub. It's there. Um, place where a lot of people can go to learn what's already happening, not kind of develop everything uh, on their own newly. There are sets of triggers, uh, ways how to uh, to analyze the risk and so on. That's it. But also coordinate, coordinate between the NGOs, NGOs and uh, Red Cross, Red Crescent and UN. Get together on country level. Uh, there are the um, dialogue platforms of the Red Cross, but there are also other like the forewarn um, groups of the start network uh, just try to see what's on the ground where you are with your ngo uh, what's already there if there's nothing yet approach the anticipation up again and say uh, there's nothing in this country can we uh, see if someone is doing something i think that's very important as you say let's do it together let's do more anticipation let's do better anticipation and let's do this together that's kind of the slogan that we often use can I add something still, or do we? Sure. Yeah. Yes. Um, so also to the NGO question, I don't know um, to what extent who asked, but we do have this um, jointly also with Welthungerhilfe and Start Network, um, this series of trainings with the IFHV for German NGOs on how to engage in anticipatory action, um, where also such things are discussed. And as Matthias said, I mean, of course, our early action protocol as Red Cross, it's it's ours in the sense that this is what we commit to do if a trigger is reached, right? This is this trigger shows when our donors are ready to give money. But the, the information is public, um, what we want to do and what the triggers are, and, um, and we share this, and um, so do the other actors. So, I mean, not not early, every early action needs to be the same, right? Um, every NGO might have different um, specific mandates or expertise as well. So not everyone needs to do the Red Cross early actions, for example. But um, what we try to do really at country level is to coordinate and share the triggers. They don't need to be identical, but it should be a, a similar logic, um, especially if we all work with the government. And there are a lot of things that NGOs might also be able to do that are not like classical FBF, but that is like, you know, contingency planning for your own projects. Like, what do we do if we have a livelihoods program for five years and our area is approached by a cyclone? What's our early action plan? Like, there are different ways to approach this. And in a lot of countries now, there are actors you can ask, as Matthias said. I also wanted to say something on the um, on the 
data for cumulative events. Um, Lisa already mentioned it for the basically cumulative of different climate things. Heat waves is a very good point because we <coughs> lack the impact data. So we know there was extreme heat, um, but we don't like in hospitals, for example. So heat often has health impact, but in a hospital, <laughs> there is, it's not recorded as someone had a heat related health problem. It's, really, it's recorded as someone had high blood pressure or had respiratory problems or had, so we don't, we are missing yet the link between the extreme heat and the impact because we don't have the impact data. So to say, when is it really a problem? And for the forecast side, we miss even the prediction sometimes because a lot of countries can predict extreme heat, but you would ideally need like a heat index that also includes humidity and other things to, um, to do this. So on the climate side, uh, we would need all data we can get, even you mentioned water shortage. Um, that's of course super useful. Our problem is often that we don't have this data or not at sufficient granularity. You know, if we know, okay, this half of a country has water shortage, that doesn't really help us to pin down. So we are only adding data to our models if it helps us also to prioritize intervention areas, for example. So we need it at a certain granularity. And I just wanted to add for the compound risk that it's not only about the cumulative impacts of climate change, but we are also really looking into, um, you know, what happens last year, for example, you have a global epidemic or pandemic, <laughs> you have locusts and you have a flood, for example how do we deal with that? And this is now something that we also look into in our EAPs, like how can we integrate this? What do we do if a storm is moving towards a conflict affected area? How do we take this compound risk layer into account? Yeah, I think that's it. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, and um, yeah, I basically need um, to end um, our discussion now, but I would like to end by asking one last question to the panel. And I would like to ask you to really try and answer only in um, 30 seconds or uh, one minute maximum. And um, I would like to know, and I, I know some of you mentioned um, these points already, um, but um, I, I would like to ask you to summarize what are, from your perspective, the most important gaps and action points and um, the collaboration opportunities with research that you see in this um, field? Um, and I would like to start with Lisa, if that's okay for you. Yes, sorry, I had to find the unmute button. <laughs> um, I think the most important points are really to collaborate, to have to have a group like the Anticipation Hub to really bring together practitioners, researchers, those who are interested, those who are actually on the ground. I mean, I personally look into data, but I don't talk to people, but I would really like to have the perspective of those who are impacted. Is that actually something useful? So a dialogue partnerships is, I think, the most useful way to go forward and with science, please. Thank you, Lisa. Dominic. Yeah, I mean, we already had quite intense uh, collaborations with different universities and research institutions. And what we always are surprised to see is how much researchers and, and, and scientists actually can do in not just predicting the weather, predicting climate, but also using different sets of data and, and vulnerability data. And really, um, we need there way more cooperation to enable this last mile, not just for us humanitarians to use the knowledge and, and, and all these amazing capacities of researchers, but also, as Lisa said, to bring it to the beneficiaries and the people on the ground to have this yeah, triangle more or less and, and enable a connection, which is on, on one level. Thanks. Matthias. Um, not an easy task. I think uh, besides the exchange that I would strongly underline, uh, I think we, specifically for or generally for anticipatory reaction we always say we want now to scale and to mainstream we have the proof of concept but we need more we need generally in the world more financing for anticipatory action but also more systems on the ground and we want to mainstream it and mainstreaming maybe is the uh, key word for the um, for the dis disaster displacement i believe we have to really include thinking about displacement risk into our anticipatory action approaches wherever possible because from there everything uh, will lead to 
proper anticipatory action that can prevent uh, displacement or reduce uh, reduce impacts of displacement. So um, exchange, scale anticipatory action in general, and include disaster displacement everywhere. Thanks. Thank you very much. And Stephanie, the, the last word is yours. <laughs> so for research, um, really the impact data that I mentioned, um, looking at past impacts of maybe hazards where the data is not so clear, and especially like how to take into account these impacts of compound events would be very important for us. But then I also, we talk a lot about research, you know, on the prediction side, and I would really like, and I'm always trying to find partners to do more practical research, you know, the engineers, like how can we best protect water wells? How can we best stabilize a roof? That's more the practical research. Um, but if you know someone who, who leads research on that, that would actually, what's the fastest way to purify water and so on, um, that would also be helpful for us. Okay, thank you very much for this last round. Thank you very much to um, the panelists for your interesting contributions. Um, thank you so much um, to the audience um, for posing the interesting um, questions. Um, I hope you all enjoyed. I certainly um, did. And yes, I wish you a good afternoon and thanks for joining us. Bye bye.